Welcome everyone to AURI Connect's Fields of Innovation, part of AURI Connect's monthly online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. I'm Dan Scoban, AURI's Director of Industry and Government Relations and your host for Fields of Innovation. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute in Minnesota. Fields of Innovation is focused on bringing together Minnesota's regional ag and food value chains to build capacity and successfully commercialize new and emerging crops. Events will focus on highlighting new crops, examining marketing opportunities for emerging crops, and highlighting new technologies in existing crops. Remember that this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Today on Fields of Innovation, we will have a slightly different discussion. We're calling it Into the Field, Developing Minnesota's Future Ag Innovators. Remember, participants are muted, but you can ask questions through the Q&A portal on your screen. To lead the discussion today, we welcome Steve Olson. Steve Olson is an agricultural consultant with over 35 years working for organizations, including the Minnesota Turkey Growers Association. Midwest Poultry Federation, the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute, and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Steve specializes in preparing agricultural organizations and individuals to address and anticipate future opportunities and challenges through strategy and action plan development and implementation. Steve also held volunteer leadership roles with the Minnesota and National FFA Alumni Associations. Steve has assembled a great panel today to take a deep dive into the landscape around the next generation of egg innovators. Steve Olson, welcome to Fields of Innovation. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, you know, as Dan mentioned, as an agricultural strategy consultant, my consulting focuses on helping build the future of agriculture today by working with businesses, nonprofits, academia, and government to make decisions about their future direction. I'm excited about today's topic because it's the intersection of, of my degree in ag education, my experience as a farm organization executive, as a former uh, AURI staffer, and as a lifelong advocate for ag education. My career developed and became and started because of my involvement in ag education and FFA. Retaining and recruiting talent is becoming an increasingly higher priority for all employers, especially for agriculture, food, and natural resource related businesses. This webinar highlights the unique role agriculture, food, and natural resources, also known as AFNR or ag education, as a pipeline for the next generation of ag employees. Last June, the Minnesota Agri-Growth Council sponsored a webinar titled Resilience in Agriculture and Food, Matching Talent to Need, which provided an in-depth look at the increasing need for young talent in agriculture, along with efforts to train, recruit, and retain talent in Minnesota's agricultural industry. Today's webinar continues that discussion. Likewise, the Ag Workforce Coalition was formed as an outgrowth of Ag Growth's uh, webinar to continue the discussion and coordinate statewide activities. The coalition consists of the organizations listed on the PowerPoint slide. The coalition has identified connecting industry and education and increasing AFNR career awareness among both the K through 14 grade levels and the current workforce in transition. For AgriGrowth members, please watch your e-bulletin for more information. For others, please contact me for additional information. Today's panel will begin with an overview of agricultural education at the secondary and post-secondary levels in Minnesota, as well as statistics on the employment gap. We will then hear from an agricultural educator at the high school level about ag education curriculum and how he introduces AFNR careers to students. We will then hear from one of uh, one high school student and another graduating in a couple of weeks from Ridgewater College. Both will tell their, their story of their path to choosing careers in agriculture. Following the presentation, we will hold a question and answer session. Please submit questions at any time during the panel discussions or panel presentation. Our call to action for you is to engage the ag education program at your local high school and college, whether it's technical, community, or four-year institution. If there's not one there, please contact us. We can help you get one started. Um, offer to be a guest speaker, host field trips, assist in preparing FFA career development event teams for competition, and offer to job shadow or, hold, uh, or host internships. For additional information on any of the topics, 
Again, please contact me and I will connect you with the appropriate resource. The webinar is being recorded and will be housed at AURI's YouTube channel. We encourage you to share this with other employers, uh, parents of school-aged children, and school administrators. Our first panelist is Keith Olander. Keith is a lifelong farmer and educator. He has farmed for over 30 years and has been in education for over 25 years. As executive director of Ag Centric, which is Minnesota State University's Northern Agriculture Center of Excellence, Keith's major responsibilities are to augment the capacity and enrollment in comprehensive agricultural education from K through 12 through post-secondary to industry. Workforce development includes building partnerships, developing seamless educational pathways, and informing audiences uh, of the agricultural web that surrounds every person who enjoys a good meal in an environment that is sustainable. Keith also oversees strategic agricultural partnerships at Central Lakes College as the Dean of Agricultural Studies. And as of also of note, as of last week, Keith was inducted into the Minnesota FFA Hall of Fame. Keith, please set the stage for today's discussions by providing an overview of ag education. Thank you, Steve. I'll do my best to live up to that introduction. So Ray, if we'll get started with that, I don't think there's much more to say that I need to say necessarily about my background. Uh, Ray, if you want to move us forward onto the next slide. So just for perspective, in the Minnesota State System and beyond, we have two centers of excellence, and I want to give a shout out to Brad Slush, who provided some of the data for today. But between the two of us, we try to maneuver agricultural education throughout Minnesota State, as well as work with our secondary partners and, of course, industry. And that's the focus of what I'm going to talk about here. So feel free to reach out with each of us as you need to, uh, depending upon where your geography is. It makes no difference on our side. Again, Ray, let's go forward. Again, Steve already alluded to this term here, but I want to bring it back to you. We in education, of course, particularly talk about this AF and R, and sometimes acronyms lose people. But agriculture, food, and natural resources is a comprehensive look at agriculture. If I say the word ag and I'm talking to parents or high school teachers, oftentimes uh, not affiliated with us, the, the, the term farming just comes up. And so I want to make clear that we're much more comprehensive in the look that we go. And I'm going to drive for where some of this terminology comes from and how it's important that you as industry should also be using some of this similar terminology for clarity as we talk to particularly the students who are not familiar with us. Let's go forward, Ray. Now you're looking at the front of a brochure that we produce, but more specifically, you need to pay attention to what we call career pathways. And each of them are outlined there. You can see them. There are eight of them. Uh, these are defined really by federal legislation, but as we educate within the secondary and post-secondary world, this is how we form all of the education around each of these pathways. A student coming through, and I even think you want to look at this as kind of a conveyor belt, a student coming through looks at this as trying to pick one of these, what's their area of interest, is a business, animal, biotech, whatever, and kind of move in that direction and of course move out from there. Um, Ray, if you add the next graphic onto this one, there's some very significant components to this conveyor belt. So it starts off, of course, down at that secondary education, which we would think of as that 712 world. And of course, for the agricultural context, we've got the soil down below, right where these students are rooted. And then moving on beyond that, from the secondary world out into post secondary and eventually the industry. The other component important note on this is that there are cogs in this in terms of how we all function together. And it's critical uh, as we're in today's workforce world, right, of all the competition that we do connect and that we are working with one another. What makes sense because from a student perspective, what is the simplest pathway we can create from the time that they enter their education, say at that sixth, seventh grade level, do the exploration, get the technical expertise, and then get out to industry. So that's kind of where I'm going to form that. But I do want you to kind of know those pathways and this AF in our language. We can go to the next one, Ray. And again, so let's talk about secondary AF and R. And I got to give Dr. Zane Sheehan out of the MDE a lot of credit here in terms of the data that's there. And go ahead, Ray, let's move the next slide up. You're going to see a fair amount of data and bring up that first little circle there, Ray. I need to point out a few things. So again, we're talking about 712 agriculture, food, and natural resources. For context, you need to know that there's 209 programs out of about 400 districts in the state. So we're roughly at 50%, maybe not quite there. And then on the other side, there's almost 300 teachers in AF and R across the system. And bring the next one up, Ray. You're looking at about 35,000 students in that world and 11,000 FFA members. And I just found out last week, as Steve alluded to from the convention, that there's actually almost 13,000 members. 
those two numbers should be quite significant to us because when we have students within AF and R, they already have determined some sort of a desire to learn about food, food production, food processing, and all the way up the chain with fiber, et cetera. Um, but these are just some really good numbers to start looking at what's the pool that's there. And if you go to the FFA side of the world, typically FFA members have already designated beyond just getting this exploratory stage, but to be what we call a concentrator. In other words, they're taking multiple courses within this realm and really wanting to study about either food or fiber as it relates to what we do every day in the world. Ray, let's go to the next one. As you look at those bottom bars, there's an interesting note here. Number one, if you look at program growth over the next the last five years, it's been pretty dramatic. I get very excited about this from my perspective. I graduated back out in the 80s, and those of you that were around at the time realized that agriculture from an economic standpoint in the 80s was not very positive. And that was not the case with these programs. So to see this trajectory moving the way it is, is really, to me, just flat out exciting. The other side then, you're seeing a little bit of a delay in the numbers of students, but they're kind of coming along now too, that we've grown from 20 plus thousand to now 35,000 and going beyond that. That is significant when it comes to a talent pool that's out there. Let's go to the next one, Ray. This one here, and go ahead and bring that circle up that's on there. I, the point here is that we've got 17 new programs that were being added, and this is all at the secondary level. I have never seen in my career, and again, it's been almost 30 years, a surge in secondary education across urban, rural, wherever, to add in agriculture, food, and natural resources to their curriculum. And we're going to take a look at why that is. But the point is, is that as we go forward in years, we've got a talent pool here. We need to figure out how do we retain them. They're drawing interest to agriculture, but how do we keep them within the industry? Let's go forward, Ray. Now, I want to take you back to that pathways piece, and it's not that we want to memorize these numbers or anything like that, but again, as we go back to the language which we use in education and academia, is this idea we break them out by system and look at where are they concentrating in studies. And you can each take away your own piece of where you fit in terms of whether it's food system or biotechnology, work-based, whatever the case is, but you'll see that they're spread there. The one thing I would point out probably that stands to me is power systems is the largest. And these are the things that we think of in diesel technology, small gas engines, uh, pneumatics, hydraulics, uh, welding, any of those really applied lab settings, that is our strongest sector, of course, closely followed by animal systems in that. And I think as you think about today's economy, where our demand really lies in a lot of talent, it stands to reason why those are so large. But again, I just want you to remind yourself from an industry perspective that these pathways are consistently used in terms of measurement at the secondary level. Okay, Ray, let's go forward. So why is there all this buzz? Let's go through, you go ahead and bring all these bullets up, Ray. Number one is this desire to learn where food comes from. Yeah, I would encourage if you have not, be around middle schoolers right now, and this whole realm of how their world functions around them and how they function in the world. And we probably on the line, and I'm one of them that I farm. And so I just, it's, it's just inherent in my knowledge that I know where food comes from. That is not the case in most of our society, in a lot of our society today. So they have this curiosity where, you know, obviously there's a grocery store, or it's Amazon or wherever your, your source is, but there's a beyond that measure that people are starting to ask about. And certainly COVID just exemplified that this last year as we watched a few shelves go empty and people were short on food. The other side is there's this urban engagement that we're seeing that we have not experienced previously. And I'll just use Minneapolis as an example. Minneapolis has got about 15 uh, high schools in their district. They now have set for fall of 21 to have a, an egg, food and natural resources faculty or teacher in that high school. That is significant in any measure, but they're not the first in the urban setting. But the bottom line is in, in our urban settings where we at one time, there was never really any discussion about why would we ever want to teach anything about food and agriculture in our urban schools. That's a change of, of attitude. I think most of you recognize if you're from industry perspective or certainly a post-secondary, the economy and the demands for career and tech ed right now and agriculture being a part of that is to a place I haven't seen. In terms of compensation, the availability of jobs, um, it's even scholarshiping students through education, the demand has really peaked. And this is really a focus probably more on the two-year setting or that diploma setting. The bachelor's, doctorate, uh, master's are certainly out there, but not to the level that we're seeing in these uh, shorter term uh, education pathways. And then there's one more on there, Ray, if you'd bring that one. The other side is this, is our youth today more than ever before, think about the globe around them and the environmental sustainability piece. 
how do we produce food and fiber while conserving our resources and thinking about water carbon storage all of these pieces they just view their world differently and there's a curiosity with that and that's driving our industry particularly from this education side now this isn't a comprehensive as to why all the buzz but i think this gives you a few bullets as to why are we seeing Parents take a different look at agriculture. Students, as they think of, you know, that sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, is there an exploratory of why these things come to mind? All right, Ray, let's go forward. So bring up the next graphic. This is just where are they located? And of course, it's a very generic map. The point is this, in Minnesota, we have a very diverse industry. If I think of what we're doing in resources and logging and mining to the Northeast, as I go to very heavy production agriculture to the Southwest, the valley on the west side has its own unique aspect. And then, of course, you got dairy mixed in in central and southeast. But the idea of the Minnesota state system is there's 37 colleges and universities, and you should have one within about 100 miles of where you live. That was really the dream and the goal, and we're very fortunate to have that. So if you haven't checked one out lately, all the white dots, and you can't read them here, but you can go Google that on your own and find that out. But the bottom line is we're very diverse, but yet we're very comprehensive at the same time. Let's go to the next slide. So this takes a different look. Now, now you're looking at the college system and you're looking at those pathways, not nearly as colorful here, but it's just some hard data. You're also talking about fiscal years. So we're backdated here a little bit, but it gives you a good perspective. Not gonna spend a lot of time. You're seeing about 500 in those pathways. And then the one thing that's not here are the university levels. You can add about 900 to each of those bottom numbers as you look, think about combining in the, the university, all right? And one thing I'm hoping that's sticking out to you is like, where did our students go? And I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide. So let's go forward, Ray. So again, I'm back to my original slide here, these pathways in this AFNR, but let's go ahead and add those graphics on now, Ray. Click that one, and then if you'll go forward one. So remember I said earlier that in the secondary education side, we've got 35,000 students. We graduate about 5,000 per year of that because that's a 712 measurement. Let's go to the next one, Ray. Of the 5,000, we know about 12 to 1,500 of them enter into some sort of post-secondary college AFNR. And right away, my heart sinks because I'm like, oh my, we're missing a great number of them. And now if I go forward to industry, Ray, and click that one up, we are also on the statistical side. This one is more of a swag because we've got various uh, statistics, but it's about three to 4,000 per year that industry demand is. And we're gonna look at some demand curves here in a few minutes. But there's the other side, there's the one that, of the growth in the industry. And then you all know very well, if you've been in the industry long enough, you're seeing a lot of retirements. The challenge is this, of the 5,000 we have in that secondary, we should be retaining about 90 to 95% of them to serve our need, and it's clear we're not. Now, you also have heard of things like healthcare, transportation, information technology, advanced manufacturing. Those are all sectors that are competing with our students, right, or for our students. And that's why I'm really encouraged to call the horn out today about we need to be more engaged in retaining our students, engaging them, and why is their careers in ag that are good and in their geography that they want. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of where the numbers go. Let's go forward, Ray. I'm gonna give you just a snapshot of a few studies. These slides will go out and you can check this out on your own, but this is on the national side. So we're in an era right now between 2020 and 2025 where we're looking at about two and a half percent growth each year as we go forward, or the 60,000 jobs. The bottom line is the ag industry continues to grow. You know that, I know that, the technologies just demand that as we go forward. We got more people to feed, it's evident. The one downside is you'll hear on the other side is where well, we need fewer farmers, the number of farmers at 2%. And that's great because we become more efficient every day. But the food chain, when we go beyond the farm all the way out to the table, is expanding at a, a good rate here. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you take this 2.6% growth, couple it with a number of retirements, and we've got almost a panic in demand right now in terms of trying to satisfy. And that's why we're seeing automation and other options come into play for a lot of industries to try to satisfy. Let's look at the state side. Ray, you want to go forward? I'm going to show a couple out of Minnesota here. Uh, number one, I wanted to point out this one. This was... Uh, done by the agri-growth, and again, the link is there. You've got almost 400,000 jobs in Minnesota that are affecting by that, are affected through agriculture. And so you can kind of see on the demand side where we've got to get to and maintain at that load going forward. Let's go to the next one. 
In January, the Center for Rural Policy and Development did another one. You can dig into this, but it shows each of those pathways I showed you earlier, there's workforce shortage in each one of them, which again, starts to create this competition factor for our students. And so we've got to be more aggressive as we think of reaching down that conveyor belt as they come out to graduate. How are we being affected by that? The one I don't have on here, and I know uh, Green Seam just did theirs as well, and it reflects much the same data, that we are in really almost a crisis move when it comes to talent within the industry. Okay, Ray, let's go forward. So what's our call to action? Well, first of all, and I, and I say we, it's the people on this call, but it's also, as I think, to our centers of excellence. You'll, as a business, when you post jobs, do you do anything around career pathway language? That's really important. And if students are part of farming and agriculture and they grew up in a rural area and they know that, it's no big deal. But if you've always just knowing agriculture is something you like to do and you've been a part of a school system and they're talking about agribusiness systems and in your posting you aren't a tying it to a career pathway you may be missing critical talent the other thing i would encourage about is literacy career fairs uh, if you need help engaging reach out to us i really also would like to get you to think about virtual career tours at your work what does your day look like what are the options in your day um, what does your company do? How does it satisfy the environmental uh, metrics that you have to work around? What is you know, your piece of the pie in terms of food or fiber production? And you know, I'm not a fan, or I shouldn't say this, I'm not a subscriber to TikTok, but I will tell you today's youth, that's really where they go. And I'm not advocating TikTok, but I'm advocating these short little one to three minute videos you can throw on YouTube and just to promote your company and to be able to use that as a way that, you know, I find in even small towns, rural Minnesota, their students within our high schools don't even know the manufacturing and processing that goes on in their own small towns. And that's unfortunate. So these virtual career tours are one option for that. The other thing is we can help you in connecting to colleges and high schools. I think it's great that if you would volunteer, and Steve mentioned this earlier, go in and talk to them for a few minutes or a part of an hour uh, that would just share what you do, how you do it, and where, where the opportunities are. And then finally, this whole idea of scholarships. I'm going to touch on that as we close, but I think there's some opportunities there that we can help you know, really entice students to think about agriculture seriously. Thank you, Ray. Let's go forward. Yeah, the another group that we've really got to key in on is this parents. We know that they're the number one influencer. And if we think of parents right now are two and three generations removed from the farm, you know, and thinking about agriculture and where food comes from, it's really key that we figure out how do we reach them. And we figured out some ways to do that. The school counselors and other school leaders are also important in that. And if we go forward, Ray, we've got another one there that I wanna point out is to foster this data collection. So here's my point on this one. If I go to a place like Deed, right? Uh, healthcare shows strong demand and they advocate that and gets promoted a lot and that's part of just because within the healthcare system the hospitals report back their hiring practices so any way that you as an industry person can support that so that we promote that there is strong demand we do that now but it would help more if we had more reporting back from agribusinesses about the reporting the hiring practices that are out there uh, just as a means of trying to collect some of that data to prove to people that there's compensation and there is demand. And thinking of those that are not engaged in agriculture and don't know this world. And finally, Ray, if you'll go down just below, there should be two web sites. Click both of those up and I believe they're going to go in the chat. But some of the resources I've shared are also available at agcentric.org or centerofag.org. And Ray, let's go to my final slide here. I'm sorry, we got two left. Uh, workforce Development Scholarships. This is a legislative pool of funds that I encourage you to think about and engage in, reach out to us for help. But this is really targeted at two-year colleges within the career and technical trades, agriculture certainly being one of them. Last year, or in the current year, the, the current fiscal year we're in, we've had 90 scholarships awarded across the system. So just for quick math, it takes about $5,800 of tuition at a two-year college per year. This $2,500 will pay about 40% of that. And they can still get some financial aid. And what I'm also getting you or want you to think about, what if you threw in $1,000 as a company to a particular student who you may want to internship with? And you form a relationship, number one, by really augmenting or growing this money here that's already available, and at the same time building a relationship with a student. If, you have, if that's something that you want, visit our website or reach out to one of us and we can help you that. But this is an important program and is ongoing because at the legislative level, they realize the serious talent issue we have going forward. All right, with that, let's go then now to my last slide and we'll summarize this thing and move on. So what I've tried to point out here is number one, we've got this huge supply of interested students. But if you go to the next click, Ray, the retention of those students, we have got to figure out a way to improve that. 
So it's a matter of how do we build relationship with them at the high school level, that they'll stay with post-secondary and move on to you as industry folks going forward. And so how do you engage, how do you recruit, and what is the possibilities of you helping in that? And we've talked to actually quite a few companies now where in their HR world, they recognize that and their challenge is how do I get to students? And that's one way where we can be a catalyst. Maybe that's a career fair, maybe it's getting into high schools, colleges, whatever. The one caution I would have is if you wait until the college level, often those students are already set in their pathway and even the companies are already courting them to their career. So we've got it. We really started to look at this as a seventh, eighth grade level and in that high school start reaching out and what I call courting, but it's kind of that idea of building relationship with students uh, for the long haul. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity, it gives you an overview of what it looks like at the secondary and post-secondary, and I gave you a little snippet of what you folks are dealing with on the industry side as well. And I know as we're going to highlight uh, Mr. Ramstead here at Staples Molly, they're one of those programs that are in that growth mode as well. So I'm very happy to have him on today. So with that, Steve, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Keith. And when I'm taking home, the take home message for me is that industry engagement is really crucial to getting in front of those students. Let them know who you are, what the, the opportunities are out there. Our next panelist, as uh, Keith mentioned, is Joe Ramstead. Joe is the ag educator at Staples Motley High School. He was a non-traditional student uh, when he was growing up because he grew up in the city of Forest Lake. So he had no previous connection to agriculture prior to taking courses when he was in high school. He is in his second year as a teacher of agriculture. And Joe's gonna talk about why he chose to take ag education courses in high school, why, he's, why he pursued a degree in ag education, as well as how he introduces students to agriculture and technology. And before I turn it over to Joe, I wanna point out that uh, Joe will be receiving the, the Teacher Turn the Key Award from the Minnesota Association of Ag Educators at their summer conference, and he will be key competing at the national level. This is a professional development award that recognizes teachers in their second to fourth year of teaching and provides them with tools and resources to help them grow as teachers. The program goal is to increase retention of ag educators in the profession. With that, Joe, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Olson, for the introduction. It's great to be here today, and thank you so much for having me and all of us panelists here today. Um, as was mentioned, I am the agriculture teacher at Staples Motley High School. So today I wanted to share a little bit about uh, my background. As Steve mentioned, it was very non-traditional. So I'll share a little bit about that and about all the opportunities we offer students here at our school as well. So um, I grew up in Forest Lake, Minnesota, which is about a half an hour north of the Twin Cities area, and had no real exposure to grade uh, mechanics class, didn't get into it. And then I got tossed into ninth grade intro to egg instead. And I wasn't the most excited about it at first, honestly, because I didn't know what agriculture was. Like I just thought that food showed up at the grocery store and did, I kind of took it for granted. But within the first couple of weeks of that ninth grade intro to egg class, I fell in love with it. Um, I didn't know that agriculture was um, included things like leadership or economics or uh, how businesses are structured and how businesses work. And um, things like dairy foods and we got to eat ice cream in our A class and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And so all of these different experiences encouraged me to become very involved within our agriculture education department at Forest Lake High School. And I have to give a shout out to my egg teachers, Ann Tozzle, Mike Miran, and Veronica Ward for all of their inspiration for me throughout the years becoming an egg teacher. So that led me to becoming very active within the FFA organization, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, and also encouraged me to attend the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where I actually graduated a couple years ago in 2019 with a degree in egg education and egg communication and marketing. And that has led me here to Staples Motley Schools. And I love uh, being in this town and being so close to the awesome resources that we have um, at Central Lakes College with Keith and everyone that is there. And also um, within our industry that we have within Staples Motley District. So if you could advance to the next slide, I'd greatly appreciate it. So within our program, we offer a variety of different opportunities for students. And a lot of these are actually articulated with uh, local colleges at Central Lakes College and also um, with graduation requirements here at our school. We serve about 300 students annually. We are adding a second agriculture food natural resources teacher next year as well because of this growth. Um, we have a little something for everyone in our department though. We have uh, courses ranging from agricultural business and economics to veterinary science to uh, advanced welding technology. Next year we're going to be offering a brand new technology course focusing on drones, DNA, and robotics that I'm going to be teaching and we're really excited to be um, 
adding these new opportunities within our district so students can be exposed to a variety of different uh, venues. Because like I mentioned, I, as a student in ninth grade, I didn't know where my food came from. And I find that even in a rural town in Staples, Minnesota, um, that that's very true up here as well. People are very removed from, from the farm and from agriculture. And it's our goal as agriculture teachers at the secondary level to bring that to those students and provide some visibility, which we'll chat about a little bit later. So as I mentioned, we have over 20 courses in our department, um, ranging again from agriculture business to mechanics and welding well, to provide hands-on technical skills for our students. Uh, and as Keith mentioned, with the AFNR Career Pathways, we do our best to offer courses in every single uh, pathway to kind of encourage those students to explore those different opportunities and hopefully find something that they like. If we could advance to the next slide. So within our program, we are fortunate enough with the support from Central Lakes College and our Perkins Consortium and all of the different resources we have in our area um, to have a variety of different facilities that expose students to technology. And I don't know about you, but when, when, when TikTok was mentioned a little while ago, my eyes got big. I love TikTok. I love um, the internet and all of these new technologies that are coming out, being up with the trends. So we try to meet students where they're at with those trends as well. We have a brand new, newly remodeled shop that we have with 10 weld. 10 um, MIG and TIG welders and 10 oxyacetylene welders that provide students with hands-on technical experiences within the trades. We also have a machining shop, a wood shop, and we have small gas engines facilities as well for our students to gain hands-on practical experiences in a manufacturing and uh, mechanical setting, which is incredible. Unfortunately, at this point, I do not teach any of those classes. The second teacher that we are adding is going to be teaching a lot of those courses, but um, we, we do have someone in there right now who's teaching those courses, and it's great for the students just to have one or two, maybe even three classes out there getting hands-on experiences that can prepare them for a hobby or career. Additionally, we also have some drone equipment that we have received recently that we are excited to uh, unveil in our new drones and ag technology class next fall. Um, I'm really excited for the opportunities that, that will present to students because drone and data is becoming very big, especially in our natural resources up here uh, within northern Minnesota. And lastly, of course, uh, we have a greenhouse and a lot of agriculture programs around the state have greenhouses and ours is very incredible. It, it's temperature regulating, so I don't have to come in at like five o'clock in the morning and worry about my plants being frozen. There's automated technology that um, makes sure that the temperature is being regulated, which is incredible. And getting to have that greenhouse and teach students about those technologies and possible careers within horticulture is something that's awesome and something that we are really fortunate to have here at our school. Um, additionally, we have a standard classroom and thanks to our friends at Central Lakes College, we also have a high tunnel and different resources that we have off campus as well in addition to a school for us. So these are just some examples of the facilities that we have in our program and I know there's other egg teachers that are on the call as well. And the facilities of every district are very unique, but I'm just so grateful that we have these resources in our district to have what we have at this moment. So if we could go to the next slide. So we have three key goals here in our agriculture education program. And I think this is very similar to what a lot of other egg programs have as well. Uh, first is visibility. Uh, coming from my experience, not knowing where my food came from and being super naive about how, how everything got to the store and into the hands of consumers. We want to simply provide visibility, not only where that food comes from, but also about the people who are involved in producing that those food, fiber, and natural resources and all of the different career opportunities that are available within this industry. Um, a lot of students, when I mentioned the different career opportunities within agriculture, especially in my ninth and 10th grade classes, they, they have no idea. They had no idea that they could have a career operating a drone. They have no idea that they could be working in an inspection facility or grading and candling eggs. Like they, they didn't think, think about that. So exposing students to these different career opportunities is huge and something that we take a lot of pride in in our department. Secondly, we provide students with hands-on experiences with technology so that they are adept for anything um, that they choose to pursue inside or outside of agriculture, food, natural resources, careers. Um, I really enjoy teaching welding my first year of teaching, and there's nothing like the face that a student gets when they light up, when they realize that they can do a weld or that they can uh, do some basic simple repairs at home on a small gas engine. Um, giving students these experiences, while they may not result necessarily in a career within ag, food, natural resources, is super important because that gives them the confidence and the skills that they need to be successful at home and maybe empower and teach other people about the 
these technologies as well. And the third uh, goal that we have in our program is to provide experiences um, that aren't necessarily always about agriculture, but also about leadership and giving them hands-on experiences, working with other people who may be different from them and giving them leadership opportunities. Over on the right-hand side of the screen, we see the three-circle model of agriculture education. And this is something that we, as an agriculture education program, try to infuse. First, we have classroom instruction, and that is what um, I should be doing right now in my class, but providing instruction and experiences um, to students and as many hands-on opportunities as we can, uh, whether that be like an agribusiness course or a welding course or animal science. Uh, second, we have supervised agriculture experience, which is um, hands-on experiences students gain outside of the classroom using the skills that they've learned through their leadership experiences or their classroom instruction experiences that they've had. So for instance, this could be as simple as a student um, learning how to sew or patch together a quilt. I have a student who's doing that right now in my eighth grade class. Um, and they're, they're gaining experiences, learning about fiber. They did some research on what types of fiber they could use for their quilting project. And now they're putting something together at home using um, basic skills that they've learned in my class. Additionally, students could work on farms, students could get um, jobs at local restaurants. These are all experiences that will provide students with skills that they need to be successful in their future. And lastly, we have this awesome organization called the National FFA. We provide opportunities for community service and leadership development in all of our agriculture courses so students can grow and develop to be the best versions of themselves when they walk out the door and they graduate. If we could go to the last slide. So thank you so much again for having me. It's been a blessing being here. And it's amazing being an agriculture education teacher. I love working with all the students I see every single day. And it's just really inspiring getting to work with our students. And so uh, previously the call to action was mentioned to really connect with your secondary programs or um, kind of turn the wheels to get a secondary program at your high school. And I would, I would echo that. I would really encourage um, to reach out to your local agriculture teacher at your district um, because we're always looking to connect students with opportunities um, outside of high school, whether that be through a supervised agriculture experience program in a high school setting or perhaps for an internship or a career uh, after high school. It's always great to see industry representatives and people within the industry come in and speak to our classes and share their wisdom and knowledge with us as the teachers and with the students. So on the screen here, I have a QR code for our local programs Facebook page. If you'd like to check it out, we post lots of things that our FFA does and our classroom experiences as well. And my contact information is there if you ever had any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Awesome presentation. I want to highlight one of the things that Joe mentioned. You referred to the three circle model. It was off the right hand side of the, I think it was the second to last slide. And it, you know, it's, we all learn differently. Some some people can you know sit in the class. They you know, they can listen to the instructor and they can pick up things and, and they're they're fine. Others maybe they need to maybe reading is better for them. But we all I think learn better when we are doing something or and if we have to teach somebody something. So I think what's what's unique about ag education it's considered intracurricular, not extracurricular. FFA is intracurricular, curricular, and so it's part of that that coursework, not only do they apply what they learn in the ag education courses, but they apply what they learn in the biology and the business courses and all of those things. And it gives them a better, uh, I think a better and a more and a deeper um, learning experience for those students that, that do that. Um, our uh, next panelist is Ben Clark. Ben is a senior at uh, Kirkhope and Murdoch Sunberg High School, and he is already pursuing a career in production agriculture. By overseeing their farm's robotic milking system, they, they milk 130 cows as well as expanding their beef herd and raising corn and soybeans. Uh, ben applies knowledge that he has learned in software, electronics, genetics, and mechanics, just to name a few. And he learned those through college level uh, classes that were offered through KMS's agricultural education program. Ben, please tell us a little bit more about, about what you've learned and you know, what, your, what your farming operation is and what you've learned in ag education. Hi there, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I live on a dairy farm, dairy beef and crop farm uh, by Murdoch, Minnesota there. And uh, we milk about 130 head of Holstein cattle. And then we have about 60, yeah, about 60 head of beef cattle. And then we run about a thousand acres of land. Uh, I got my start in farming and whatnot from my dad and my sister and my uncle. They really showed me that if you want a future in ag that you have to start young and you have to keep going throughout and you can't give up on anything. Uh, through school, I learned through my uh, college grade or college level classes. I did an agronomy class and uh, 
in the ag mechanics class and uh, an animal science course that we took. And it was, it really opened my eyes to learn about other species of animals that we don't have in the farm and about uh, crops and weeds and pesticides and all that stuff that go together with farming that I didn't know much about. So. So Ben, talk about, cause it, uh, you've been involved in the agri-science fair uh, that, that ag education offers. Talk a little bit about some of the projects you worked on there. Yeah, I did a uh, couple science fair projects through FFA and they were uh, testing protein in, cat, in dairy cow's milk to see if uh, stage of lactation or age of cow affected the protein in their milk so that we could see if um, keeping or if we could make changes to the ration at all to uh, try to up their protein intake a little bit and so we can get a little bit more out of the milk. And then another project we did was uh, uh, testing welds for uh, strength. So we did three different types of welding and then uh, just put them in a press and tried to see if, tried to see which one was strongest so that I could figure out what I should use to fixing farm equipment at home. And another one was uh, testing different breeding programs for dairy cattle that we just, yeah, just different breeding programs that brought it, was brought up to us, us by our veterinarian. And uh, that really opened, was a eye opening. So you could see what was most cost efficient and the most, most effective throughout the whole herd. So of those three, which one, you know, what were the results of one of, you know, one of those that, that surprised you the most or, or that was most valuable to you? Well, I would, I would have to say that the uh, um, breeding program experiment was the most beneficial, beneficial to me because after I did that experiment, we changed up our whole breeding program and were able to get a higher conception rate in the barn so we could keep the barn as full as we could. And uh, yeah, it was just, really great to see all the results that we did get out of it. So what message would you have for other, other students, you know, middle school or, or high school students about the importance of the, in ag education for you? Uh, just if you start, just stay with it. It's, it's nothing that you can get really good at overnight. It's a process that you have to just keep going through and it, it uh, turns out to be very beneficial to, to you in the future, honestly. So, and it, uh, it's really eye opening to see how much, how many different um, things are available for you, for you out in the real, out in the real world so that you can go and have a good future. That's great. Uh, you know, again, I think the last week was a state FFA convention. And one thing that I think each one of the hall of fame inductees said their advice to FFA members was try different things. Ag education gives you the opportunity to try different things. Yeah, definitely. That's a big thing. I like myself. I didn't stick with just science fair stuff. I tried as much stuff as I had had the opportunity to take advantage of. So, great, good advice. So, our final panelist is Skyler uh, Swenhagen. Uh, Skyler is was raised on a corn and soybean farm near Westbrook, Minnesota, and in a couple of weeks she will graduate from Ridgewater College. Although she is working full time already um, for Grandview. Um, Climate View um, uh, as a, uh, drawing a blank on the name of the, the, the career right now, but she is, uh, she's getting, she'll graduate with a, a two, actually two associate degrees, one in uh, precision uh, agriculture, precision technologies, and the other in um, agribusness with a minor in, or an emphasis in agronomy. Skylar, talk a little bit more about, you know, what your career decision, your, your career path, you know, what you did in high school that kind of led you to, to go to Ridgewater and then what your experience has been there. Yeah, so hi everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I started out on a crop farm, as Steve said. Uh, we raised corn and soybeans, and it is down by Westbrook, Minnesota, which is about 45 minutes southeast of Marshall, Minnesota, if you know where that is. Um, so that kind of sparked my interest for the agriculture um, sector. And when I was in high school, um, I got involved with our FFA chapter. And my egg teacher really pushed me to try out some different CDEs. Um, so I started out on the floriculture team, which is dealing with flowers, making arrangements, making bouquets, that type of thing. And that, that was really fun. Um, so I decided to keep 
getting involved in FFA. So I also did the FFA officer team. I did FFA trap shoot. Um, I did the test plot and I just kept getting more involved and it kept sparking my interest more and more. Um, but there's so many different sectors. So I decided to start, you know, trying different jobs. So the summer of my junior year, which would be the summer of 2018, I accepted an internship position through a research station um, by Lamberton, Minnesota, which is also through the U of M. And they do a lot of research for crops on like corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, small grains. And so a couple of my duties were to like stage soybeans and do some water sampling and that type of thing. Um, and I really enjoyed that, but that just, I wanted to try something else. So the summer after I graduated high school, I went and worked for Central Crop Consulting and I was a full-time soil sampler for them. And then I decided to go to Ridgewater College where I pursued an agribusiness degree with a crop emphasis. And Ridgewater requires two internships. Um, they give you a month off in the fall and a month off in the spring to do those internships. Um, so my first one was through Meadowland Farmers Cooperative um, by Westbrook, Minnesota. They taught me how to applicate dry fertilizer and how to like fill the tower, mix the fertilizer, that type of thing. And I really enjoyed that. Um, so I went back to Ridgewater for the winter months. And then that following spring, I decided to try out CHS, which is another local cooperative out of Tracy, Minnesota. Um, I did all sorts of things for them. I was helping with seed treating, seed sorting, seed deliveries in the spring months. During the summer, I did a lot of scouting for like insects and weeds and some stand counts. Um, and then I went back in the fall and helped them apply anhydrous ammonia and also helped with some more fertilizer stuff. And now I will be graduating um, coming up in May and I also added on a precision degree um, so I'm going to end up with two majors, and I am currently working for Climate Field View as a lead activation specialist, which is a precision agriculture program that you can use in your tractors, your combines, your sprayers, and it just maps the data. Um, so my position is kind of that support line where if a grower is having issues with the system or needs help installing, they can call me and I can walk them through it or go out to their farm and help them. Super, great overview. So talk a little bit more about what the importance of those internships were in helping you get some experience and decide in which path you wanted to go. Yeah, so those internships really allowed me to see what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, for instance, soil sampling is not one of my favorite things to do, but I would not have known that without testing it out and seeing how it all happened. Um, I really did enjoy applying uh, dry fertilizer, but that's just, I think the hours aren't for me, but right now in my position, pre precision position, um, I'm really enjoying it and meeting with all the growers and getting to travel. So how about you know, your experience in FFA and some of the, the competitions that you participated in, how has that helped you be able to relate to your customers now? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So before I started out in FFA, I was a very, very shy person. Um, so FFA helped me, you know, get out of my shell, make um, connections, talk to other people, and just see like there's other people out there that are just as passionate about agriculture as I am. So that really just sparked my passion and told me, yeah, I was able to do this. Super, great, great. Thanks, Skylar. So we're gonna open it up to questions. Again, we've got some in the queue already and I've got some additional ones here uh, as well. So we have a question for Keith. Uh, can you speak to how internships, co-ops, real work projects might be a tool to help industry connect with students and schools? Yes, yeah, certainly, thank you, Steve. That is a key point and uh, Skylar did a nice job of talking about that in terms of internship. That's one of the ways that we can figure out how do we get a learning situation through our supervised ag experience program at the high school or obviously the college's internships are widespread but that ability to be able to work at a company that's non-committal for the company but at the same time gives that student maybe a three-month experience uh, is a great way to do that there's other options out there as listed i mean you talk about the different co-op work that can be accomplished but 
any way that we can offer it and do that in a way that makes sense. And I say that because if you're under 18 years of age, there's some restrictions on what you can or can't do at the agricultural setting. But that is one way just to reach out, work with your high schools or your colleges to how do we engage or hire students on a short term basis. And oftentimes we see those turn into careers uh, often at that same company. Great. So a question for you and Joe, uh, whichever one he wants to, to start off, you, you know, how you mentioned the, the, the uh, Minneapolis School District is starting an egg program here in the next year. You know, how do the rural schools as well as the metro areas, you know, engage, you know, not kind of those non-traditional ag students that, again, we've got a small, we've got a decreasing population of students that are actually coming from agricultural settings and how do we, how do we reach a broader audience or how are you reaching a broader audience? Joe, why don't you start and share what your demographics look like in your classroom? Okay, great. So I would say that probably about 10 to 15 percent of my students come from a production agriculture farm type background, and the remaining 85 to 90 percent of students uh, do not. And that's been honestly kind of um, very interesting for me as a teacher, because coming to a rural school from an urban or suburban type of school, I thought it would have been a lot more production heavy, but it's presented a great opportunity for me to connect with the students who don't come from an agricultural background, because I share that common theme with them um, coming from a suburb myself. Um, and I know that for me going in high school, it was probably even more like 3% or less, like maybe one student in every A class had a production background. Um, so it is a lot more popular up here than it is in the cities. I will say that, but it's still, it's, it's very heavy on the non-traditional background. All right. Before we leave you, Joe, what are some of the more popular classes that you're teaching or you see students interested in? Yeah, at this point, I think that animal science, anything with veterinary science, I teach at college and the school's animal science class. Those courses are, are very popular. Also, agribusiness and agricultural economics, um, partially because those help meet course graduation requirements, but also because I think there's a lot of demand and interest for careers in those areas from the students here at our district. And okay. also... Um, welding and small gas engines courses are also pretty popular at our school as well. Okay. Uh, Keith, I, I forgot to give you a chance to answer that last question. Any other, anything else to add? No, I would just reaffirm the 90% mark that Joe talks about that come non-farm. That's overwhelmingly the majority of students that enter into agriculture um, in, in terms of agricultural education. The other side I would say is that every high school in particular is charged really are trying to get their uh, chapter and their program to reflect their community. So we think of certain uh, communities of color that where there's a higher percentage, then they want to grow those populations that are intentional in that way. And I think of, you know, Wabasso or, or Mountain Lake or Monoman or, or districts like that, um, always trying to look at diversifying literally the skin color within the classroom as we think about our needs in agriculture and satisfying uh, those particular needs. And they also come in with a different way of desire to learn for where they're going in production in the long term. Um, I taught in the district previously at a high school level too, where I had uh, students of color and did the same thing. You, you change up in your classroom what you're doing to try to fit uh, their needs and their desires and their outcomes as it fits their culture. So that's, I think, an important note to make here as well, beyond just the 90% being uh, off the farm. All right, super. Uh, let's shift our uh, next uh, couple of questions to Skylar and Ben. So what was the uh, what was the favorite class that you took in ag education, whether it was in high school or Skylar, in your case, with college? And then also, what excites you about the future of agriculture? Skylar, do you want to go first? Okay. Um, probably my favorite classes were it's gonna be biased, but any of the agriculture classes, um, to name a few, it was that intro to egg class in ninth grade um, where we got to weld and we got to learn about, you know, the different animals and make the ice cream, you know, that type of just basic egg stuff. That was my favorite. Um, another one was leadership development. That one was more um, FFA um, kind of angled, but that one was really fun too. Um, my high school egg teacher, Josh Barron, did a really good job just pushing us to, you know, try different things, and his classes were very hands-on. So those ones were probably my favorite, um, and then my college courses were probably my precision ones with Kurt Yost. Um, we got to fly a $26,000 spray drone this last semester, and that was pretty fun. Um, what excites me about 
egg industry is there's just so many new and up and coming things, um, especially on the precision side where things are gonna get just tuned in and we're gonna be able to get you know higher yields and higher accuracy and all kinds of new fun things. Okay, Ben? Yeah, uh, some of my favorite classes would have to be probably the eggs me egg mechanics courses or the um, metals and shop classes I took. Those were probably my most favorite. And then uh, everything, anything really hands-on. Uh, something that excites me about the future is that there's endless opportunities for anything. There's always a job open for something. Yeah, that's a great comment. And again, I think it was pointed out earlier that the nice thing about agriculture, it's everything from working directly on the farm, you know, with crops and animals all the way through to the consumer. And so there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, what would, and again, this is for, we'll have you start Ben, but what would you tell somebody that's not involved in agriculture about the future of agriculture? Well, at least give it a shot. I mean, the worst thing you're going to do is not like it, but I mean, it's not going to set you back anything. You're bound to learn something in it. Good. Skyler? Uh, yeah, I'm going to piggyback, piggyback off what Ben said. Um, you can learn anything in agriculture, such as gardening, like people in town garden, um, and that's just simple agriculture. So go out, try it, give it a shot, and you're bound to retain something that you'll use in your future. Good, good. So a question for Keith and, and Joe. So what programs or events are you creating to engage or educate parents concerning careers in agriculture for their children? Because they, they have a big influence, whether it's direct or that voice in the back of that, uh, that uh, child's head. You know, how, how do you engage the parents you know, to influence them or to let them know more what the opportunities are? Some successful things that we've had are, we have a technology trailer that travels, it's out in Ogilvy today. And so if you can be in that scenario in a career fair or whatever and, and engage them, just in communication, but our trailer has got a mural on of agriculture, just opens that discussion about why would your student fit into that uh, particular sector. And it, it really, I go back to my earlier comments about it's not just farming, right? Beyond that, we've done some other things like starting to translate some of our materials into other languages, which starts to reach out into uh, students of color and different cultures and try to engage them as well. Uh, probably our best scenario is when we can have peer parent-teacher conferences and we're present as a uh, exhibitor and you wanna engage directly with those parents, uh, start talking about that. Because it's one thing to talk to students about careers, but again, to get those parents in and really be where they are at events like parent-teacher conference is really good. But Joe, I'd be curious to see how you're doing at Staples. I would echo parent teacher conferences and that's like a lot different this year with coronavirus, but that's one of the greatest opportunities I have at least to network and meet my students' parents and kind of put a bug in their ear about what I see them do in my, their student do in my classroom and encourage them to maybe pursue a career within agriculture, food, natural resources. Additionally, we do a lot of things within our local FFA program that results in community outreach and um, reaching parents and community members and informing them about where their food comes from. So this year with COVID, uh, we did a lot of like drive-through experiences with agriculture literacy and we opened that up throughout the entire community. And one of them was actually hosted at Central Lakes College in their parking lot where we did a little uh, drive through corn feed, if you will, um, to share a little bit about where corn comes from and the different um, inputs and um, processes that occur with corn, such as ethanol production and um, other venues such as that. And just getting out there and reaching as many people as we can is honestly one of the best ways. And we, we obviously get to interact with a lot of our students' parents along the way as well. Super. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. So I'm going to put a quick plug in, as uh, Dan mentioned at the outset, is that um, I've been involved in Minnesota FFA alumni at the local, state, and national level. Alumni is that group, that's that community support that helps support that ag educator because these are doing, you know, they're, they're working beyond the, the classroom or the school day and, and working with a lot of different teams and stuff. And so there's that support. If you've got an interest in starting alumni, let me know. Um, and again, I, I thank Skyler, Ben, uh, Joe, and Keith for your time today and your insight. This has been very helpful. With that, I turn it back to Dan. All right, Steve, thank you so much. And uh, to all the panelists, yes, a great guest today and uh, good information. And that does conclude AURI Connects Fields of Innovation for today. 
presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. Join AURI Connects Fields of Innovation on May 28th for our next program. May is National Beef Month, so to mark the occasion, we'll be joined by a panel of Minnesota beef producers and cattle industry leaders working to increase the environmental sustainability of beef production using regenerative agriculture practices. So please join us to hear more about their efforts and the work that's being done throughout the state to find innovative ways to connect regenerative and sustainable practices to livestock production. Again, that's coming up May 28th. And of course, we always welcome your feedback on our programs. So please respond when we send out our evaluation. Thank you for participating today and remember to visit the Fields of Innovation Facebook page. For more information on Fields of Innovation or any of the work that AURI is involved with, you can go to auri.org.